Hello and welcome back to the Melge Gaming YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be going back and talking about audio quality again. Specifically how to set up a microphone properly again. This seems to be something that people continue to struggle with. I still hear a lot of poor quality audio setups that introduce a lot of unnecessary hum or buzz or background noise or some other kind of artifact that your viewer doesn't want to listen to. It makes them want to cut their ears off or leave your channel. And not many of them are going to be cutting their ears off. So today I'm not just going to throw some settings at you for you to copy and continue to not understand them. I intend to try and teach the core concept of the process of capturing a clean and good quality audio source so that you can apply them to any scenario. The truth is that one person settings are very unlikely to work for somebody else. You've probably got a different mic you're in a different room with different surfaces, you've maybe got a different audio interface if you're on XLR, or a different motherboard if you're on USB. You can't just copy and paste somebody else's settings and expect them to work for you. Now before we get started, I just wanna let you know that I'm aiming to put out a couple of videos a month aimed at helping smaller streamers and content creators grow and develop their skills. If that sounds like something that's of interest to you, then consider hitting that subscribe button and turning on notifications to get notified when future videos go live. But for now, let's get into it. So the first thing that you need to consider when we're talking about capturing audio is what are you capturing and then picking the right microphone to do that job. There are lots of different mics available today and some of the most common ones are dynamic mics, condenser mics, ribbon mics and tube mics. Now for streaming and especially for capturing vocals for live streaming, we're only interested in two of these mics, the dynamic mic and the condenser mic. Let's have a look at the differences. Dynamic microphones are the most common microphone in use today. Uh, they're what you tend to see when you go and see anything in a live environment on a stage. Uh, your favorite singer is almost definitely uses a dynamic microphone when they perform live. Now, dynamic mics are particularly suited towards live performance for a few reasons. Generally speaking, dynamic mics are not overly sensitive, which means you can have them in a live environment, like on a stage surrounded by other musicians, and it's only really going to pick up the signal of any noise that's being channeled directly into the microphone. So as a singer, you wouldn't have any drums coming through your mic or anything like that. Now this obviously translates really well into streaming because you don't want to be picking up any background noise from around you. Dynamic mics are also robust, tend to be fairly cheap, and they don't require any external source of power. Now let's compare this to condenser mics. Condenser mics are still extremely common for recording vocals, and and your favorite singer almost definitely uses one of these when they record in a studio. And that's the major difference between a dynamic mic and a condenser mic. Condenser mics tend to pick up more of the lower and higher frequencies. It has a broader frequency response, but in order to do that, they tend to be much, much more sensitive. This additional sensitivity is required to give you that broader frequency response, but it does also make the microphones more susceptible to picking up background noise. This is why the use of condenser mics for vocal capture is generally reserved for treated studio rooms with you know, good soundproofing and dampening so that reflections aren't bouncing off the wall and causing all kinds of issues. In short, unless you have a well-designed, acoustically treated room to stream in, which is quiet with little to no background noise, then you want a dynamic mic. Now, if you are lucky enough to have, uh, you know, a, a quiet room that's acoustically treated with no background noise, then you probably could consider a condenser mic. It probably will give you a nicer tone overall. Uh, but I think for the majority of people watching this video, a dynamic mic is what you're going to want. So that's what we're going to focus on from here on out. So we've settled on a dynamic microphone. Uh, the next step would normally be to figure out what polar pattern you want. We're not going to dive into that today. All you need to know is that a polar pattern describes the direction from which a microphone picks up noise and you want a cardioid polar pattern. So that's a dynamic microphone with a cardioid polar pattern. The cardioid polar pattern just means that it will only pick up noise coming from directly in front of it and not from the sides or behind. The next decision we then need to make is, do we want an XLR microphone or a USB microphone? And honestly, 
I don't think it matters that much, especially not at this level. I do believe that XLR microphones do give you a better quality uh, end result overall. And if you're multi-tracking bands and stuff like that and you're intending to manipulate your end signal a lot, then I would definitely recommend that you use an XLR mic. But for something as simple as live streaming and just casual broadcast audio, I think a USB microphone nowadays is perfectly fine. Now for those of you that do decide to go down the XLR route, I will rattle off just a few uh, audio interfaces that you should probably consider as a live streamer. The ones that I would recommend are the Focusrite Scarlet series, uh, the Go XLR series and the Behringer UMC series. Go and check those out. The most important thing that you're looking for, uh, read the reviews, see what other people think about them, uh, but also have a look at the preamps and what kind of gain they offer and how much signal boosting it offers because that can be an important factor in picking the right audio interface. Anyway, moving on, back to USB microphones because I feel like that's where most of you are going to be placed. So we've settled on a dynamic microphone, a USB dynamic microphone, although all the steps are the same from here on out, even if you've gone for an XLR mic, so no need to worry there. And the next step is arguably, in my opinion, the most important one. The most important thing that you can do when it comes to capturing audio is to get the sound right at the source and by that I mean getting the best sound possible before making any enhancements with software on your PC and instead experimenting with things like mic placement and gain levels and additional dampening in the room. Now most USB mics these days come with a desk stand. If you receive a USB mic with a desk stand I want you to open the box, take the desk stand and throw it in the bin. Desk stands for microphones are awful for a number of reasons, but the main one is it places the mic on your desk and that is just awful for so many reasons. The mic is lower than you need it to be. That means it's going to be further away from your mouth. That means you're going to have to turn the gain up for it to be able to pick you up properly. By turning the gain up, you're introducing hum and buzz. You're making the microphone more susceptible to picking up background noise. It's just a bad idea. Take the desk stand, throw it in the bin and get yourself a boom arm. Make sure that you do get a boom arm for your microphone for a number of reasons. It takes the mic off of the desk, which would remove any vibrations. Most boom arms come with some kind of springs or shock system in them to help with those vibrations anyway. It also means you can get the microphone nice and close to your mouth. That means you don't have to crank the gain anymore. That means less background noise and less hum and less buzz and just a cleaner signal overall. Now that we've got the microphone off of the desk and in front of your face where it belongs, let's have a look at setting the gain levels properly. For you USB users, we're gonna have a quick look at a setting in Windows here that you need to just check is correct. So go down to your sound panel, click the little arrow and right click the speaker and select open sound settings, which will take you to your control panel. You need to select sound control panel on the right, which will open a new window and go to the recording tab and find your microphone in the list. Right click it and select properties. You will need to go to the levels tab and make sure this slider is up to 100. Check for a tab called advanced or enhancements and untick anything in the tabs called advanced or enhancements. You don't want that stuff. If you open up OBS Studio or whatever broadcasting software it is you're using or whatever you're using to capture your microphone and look at the mixer channel where your microphone goes, uh, you will see that it runs from green to yellow to red and in that red section is where clipping occurs. Now this gets a little bit technical, but bear with me because it, it is really important. Um, your microphone or your audio interface, depending on whether you're XLR or USB, has something in it called a preamp. And that is what takes your weak electrical signal and amplifies it into an audible signal that we can work with on a PC. Now, if you push this preamp, beyond its capabilities, you will experience something called clipping. This is where the preamp is having to attempt to output a signal beyond its maximum capabilities. And in the process of trying to do so, it damages the audio signal in a way that cannot be repaired. A clipped signal sounds uh, overdriven or distorted, incomplete and generally unpleasant to listen to as far as vocals go. Therefore, it's really important to make sure that we do not let our signal clip at any point. That's an important distinction because your signal can clip 
at various stages in your setup depending on how you've set your, your audio signal up. Now that's one of the benefits of being on USB is that there are less stages at which you can be clipping and there's less stages at which you can introduce interference into your signal and things like that. Uh, with XLR mics, you're going to need to ensure that you're not clipping at the audio interface stage as well as within the broadcasting software or recording software, whatever it is you're using to capture your audio. So you can see here, if I crank the gain up on my audio interface, these LEDs turn red and indicate that the signal is clipping. Even if I turn down the channel mixer in OBS to bring that signal out of the red, the signal has already clipped at the audio interface stage and there's no repairing that. You need to back off the gain on your audio interface until the peaks are only just sort of creeping into the yellow. Now open your broadcasting software or your recording software. USB users, set your microphone channel volume to the maximum and turn the gain on your microphone all the way to zero. Now begin speaking into your microphone and slowly increase the gain on your mic until the signal on the channel is sort of bouncing into the yellow at its loudest points. XLR users, now that you've set the gain on your audio interface so that your incoming signal peaks into the yellow, don't touch that gain dial again. We make all of our adjustments and software from here on for XLR users. Well, for everyone actually. So again, open OBS um, and have a look at the, the channel signal rising and falling with your microphone. And you need to get it so that the peaks inside of OBS are falling into the yellow again. So that either means backing it off if it's a bit too loud or pushing it up if it's too quiet. Now, if it's too quiet and you cannot get your peaks into the yellow on OBS, do not turn up the gain on your audio interface. Don't worry about it we can fix this a little further down the line. Okay, so we have our levels set. Now would be a great time to just grab a quick recording of yourself and listen back to it. How does it sound? Are there any background noises that you need to eliminate by either removing them or by repositioning the microphone? Uh, is there loads of echo because you're sat in an empty room? Do you need to pad the room out more? Do you need to move some furniture around or maybe add some curtains and cushions and other soft materials to dampen the room down just a little bit? As I explained earlier, getting the best possible sound at this stage is the key to having a killer mic sound. So you've recorded your audio and you've listened back to it. You've assessed it and you've maybe adjusted your mic position or added some more dampening in your room to get the best sound possible. Your levels are now set and we're pretty happy. So for me, the next step is to add four specific filters inside of OBS or whatever software it is you use. Uh, in a very specific order and that is important because these filters are processed sequentially and not simultaneously. So for OBS users, go to your audio channel, click the cog, select filters and click to add a noise suppression filter and select RN noise. This will use AI to determine what in your signal is unwanted background noise and remove it. The next thing you want to add is a noise gate and a gate is exactly that. It's a gate that swings open and closed to allow noise through or to stop noise coming through. You'll need to set an open threshold and when your audio signal reaches this open threshold the gate will begin to open to allow the noise through. The time that it takes the gate to open is called the attack time. And a quick attack time will mean a gate that opens very quickly and a slow attack time will mean one that opens much more gradually. Your gate will then remain open for as long as your audio stays above the close threshold, which is separate from the open threshold. When your audio does come down below the close threshold, the gate will hold open for a set period of time known as the hold time and then it will begin to close. The amount of time that it takes to close is called the release time. A fast release time means a fast closing gate and a slow release time means a slow, more gradually closing gate. You should use noise suppressors and gates to remove pesky, unwanted background noise. You will need to experiment with the settings on the gate. There is no uh, right or wrong, there's no template. It depends on your mic, your gain levels, your room, your you know surroundings and what's going on around you. So you will need to play primarily with the open threshold and the close threshold on the gate to make sure that you're not cutting off the start of your sentences 
but also to make sure that you're not letting through loads of background noise. And it's just a case of trial and error. The next filter you're going to add is going to be a compressor. Now a compressor takes an audio signal and says, if at any point this audio signal becomes louder than X, where X is a threshold set by you, then I, the compressor, will work to reduce the volume of that audio signal. The amount that a compressor will try to reduce an audio signal by is known as the ratio. And much like a gate, a compressor also has an attack and a release time, which have the sort of same similar meaning. Attack time is how long it takes for the compressor to kick in, and the release time is how long before it leaves your audio signal alone. Now, what a compressor is designed to do is to compensate for the dynamic nature of your voice. You do not speak at one volume even when you try very hard to. There are constant volume fluctuations in the way that you speak. And a compressor seeks to try and level those out. So it tries to sort of bring the quiets up and the louds down and compress your signal to be a more constant volume. Again, these settings are very individual to your setup and your circumstances, but I can say that I've had the most success by setting a ratio of either three to one or four to one. The ratio and the threshold are probably the uh, most important things for you to play around with when you're looking at your compressor. And again, it's trial and error. Use some settings, record it, listen back to it, analyze it and just decide which one you like the most and go with that. Now, the last thing that I would apply to a microphone signal is some EQ or equalization to help bring out the nicest tones of your voice. But that is a whole topic in itself. And I think we're going to do that in a separate video because I think I've waffled for long enough today. Now, I've tried to go really ham on this video and give you all of the information and skills that you need to be able to uh, understand, assess, analyze, and get the best out of any audio setup and situation so that you're not just blindly copying Harris Heller's settings and hoping that they're going to work for you because the chances are they're not. Audio is a tricky, fiddly thing to get right and it requires a lot of patience, testing, adjusting, retesting and just going through the whole process start to finish until you find something you're happy with. Um, hopefully this is at least giving you some of the skills and information you need to be able to get the best out of your setup and make sure that your stream audio is top notch. As always, don't forget to like, comment, uh, subscribe and turn on notifications to get notified when future videos go live. And thanks for watching.